if you're a writer, this is going to help you write better, faster, possibly more creatively, possibly, you know, on topics that you haven't explored writing. If you're a video creator, this is going to help you up level the video production that you can do. You're going to be able to do things you never thought you'd be able to do because AI exists. Today, I'm very excited to be joined by Matt Wolf. If you don't know who Matt is, you need to know Matt. He's an AI tools expert who helps marketers and content creators embrace the future. His YouTube channel is youtube.com slash Matt Wolf with an E on the end. And his site is futuretools.io. And it curates the latest AI tool and news. Matt, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. I've been listening to the show for a while, listening to the, uh, reading the blog for a while. So excited to be a part of it finally. Well, I'm very, very excited to have you here today. Today, Matt and I are going to explore AI tools for creators. And when I say creators, you know, if you create any kind of content, you're a creator. So this this interview is going to be for you. Now, Matt, um, before we get into the fun stuff about the AI tools, I want to roll back the clock a little bit and ask mm -hmm. you, How'd you get into marketing and ultimately into AI? Start wherever you want to start. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, my story goes all the way back to about 2007 when I was I was working at a day job in a manufacturing company. I started to get really into digital marketing. I was on the Warrior Forum when when I was on my breaks at work trying to learn about marketing and various ways to make money online and things like that. And I was just sort of a student of marketing. I did some freelance web development for people on the side outside of my day job and started to learn about WordPress. And in 2009, I decided to completely quit my job, making almost no money online whatsoever yet. But I decided I'm going to go and quit and sort of burn the ships <laughs> and try to figure out how to build an online business. And so in 2009, I just I, I quit my job, went all in on online business. Uh, started building websites, mostly WordPress blogs, and selling AdSense and selling various advertising on the blogs, and actually managed to ramp that up to a decent income. I then started selling online courses around how to build blogs and WordPress and the various plugins and how other people can sort of recreate what I did with WordPress. And from 2009 all the way up to about 2022, I was sort of jumping around and creating different online courses. And I learned and taught copywriting and media buying with Facebook and Google ads and just all of the things, all of the various uh, you know avenues you could go down in the marketing world. I sort of studied and taught and was just kind of all over the place, throwing spaghetti at the wall, trying to see what stuck. My YouTube channel, I actually started in 2009 where I was making you know, content around WordPress, WordPress blogs, WordPress plugins, various tools for WordPress. I've always kind of been that tools guy that wanted to show off really cool tools, but the YouTube channel just never really got any traction. It was just sort of a side thing. When I had a fun video I wanted to make, I would make it, toss it on YouTube, and they just never really went anywhere. Fast forward to 2022, AI started to bubble up a little bit. I started making some videos around AI image generators. Early on, I was making videos about DALI and Stable Diffusion and some of these, these early tools. And those videos actually started to get some traction. I made one where I generated images of wolves and made a video. And that video got you know 2,000 views, which was like my best video ever by that point. And I went, oh, maybe there's something to this AI stuff. I'll make some more videos about it. I made a video about how to actually train your face into AI also in 2022. That video did really well. It got like 15,000 views in the first like week that I published it. So that just sort of solidified, maybe I should be going down this AI path a little bit more. And then ChatGPT came out, I think, I can't remember if it was in the very end of 2022 or the very beginning of 2023. The timeline's a little fuzzy to me, but ChatGPT came out. November of 2022, late November, that's when it There you go. Out. So it was around November, I made a video about ChatGPT soon after it came out. That video, actually, I, I went to sleep the night that I made that video. Um, I think I published it at like 10 p.m., was working on it all day, went to bed, woke up the next morning and saw that that video had 60,000 views on it. In, wow. You know, the yeah. eight hours that I'd gone to sleep. Okay, pause right there. So what was the video about and why do you think it went so well? So I actually called that video, this is better than ChatGPT because ChatGPT was 
in the media, it was all hyped up. Everybody was talking about chat GPT, but I was showing off a tool that leveraged the same technology. It was leveraging GPT-3, but it was also at the time uh, free to use. It actually had um, less censorship in it. It was called um, OpenAI's Playground, which was, you know, they were both put out by OpenAI, but this was a little bit more open, more free to use. You can do a little bit more with it. So I made a video about how if you use this GPT-3 with Playground, you can actually get better results out of it than you can get out of chat GPT. So sort of comparing and contrasting the two, and that video just exploded. It actually went on to do, I think, 1.1 or 1.2 million views over the course of that video being live. Okay, but I got to ask you, when you woke up and you saw that video, <laughs> what were you thinking? Oh, I mean, I, I was blown away. I'd never seen those kinds of numbers on any YouTube video ever. I think at that point, the best video I'd ever done got 15,000 views. And so, you know, I went to my wife and I was I was like, look, look, look at this video. Check this out. I My, my video's done 60,000 views. And um, I started actually getting calls from, from people on the phone that were like, you know what? I don't even subscribe to you and YouTube recommended your video to me. So I started like people started telling me, hey, you're just getting recommended on the YouTube homepage and I'm not even following you on YouTube. Like what's going on? So wow. it was just this crazy experience where, you know, all of a sudden people, you know, who knew I was doing marketing stuff and didn't quite understand my world. They knew like, oh, Matt does something on the Internet. They all of a sudden started calling me going, oh, I get it now. I'm starting to see your videos. And I think most people just assumed that's what I've been doing all along. And that was what my business was. But I was starting to get a lot more attention all of a sudden. And YouTube was starting to just organically recommend my videos to, to you know, friends and family. And it's it, it was a very surreal experience. But it was it was definitely a fun roller coaster to be on. <laughs> so we're recording this in July of 2023. It's going to come out probably in August. Mm -hmm. Um Bring us up to now, like what happened? Because clearly a lot has happened in the last six or seven months, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. So what I started doing was, A, I, do, I just said I'm going all in on this AI stuff, right? The last three videos in a row I've done have just been hit after hit after hit. They get bigger and bigger and bigger. My YouTube channel is an AI channel now. I'm just going to go all in on that. I also went and created a website called Future Tools. And what Future Tools was, it was a sort of aggregator of all the cool tools that I've come across. So up until now, whenever I came across a really cool AI tool, I was putting it into a Google spreadsheet and I was kind of putting a little description of what that tool did in the spreadsheet. But, you know, as I was finding more and more cool tools and I was going deeper and deeper down these rabbit holes, that spreadsheet just kind of became unmanageable, right? I, I had a hundred tools on it. There was no filtering, no sorting. I started to lose track of what was what. So I literally built this future tool site as just, a way for me to organize the various tools I'd come across. I heard about a tool called Webflow, which had really good sorting and filtering features in it. So I can, you know, click a button for AI generator tools and it would sort of sort down to just those AI uh, image generator tools. So I started building this website in Webflow. I built it on a Saturday. My son was literally sitting next, my 10 year old son was sitting next to me, like watching me build this saying, hey daddy, drag this over here. You should make this look like this. And so me and my son sort of built the website together on a Saturday. Uh, on Monday, I went and posted it on Twitter. I, I throw it up on Twitter and I said, hey, here's a cool website that I made that just kind of organizes all the cool AI tools that I came across. That got retweeted by Robert Scoble. It got retweeted by a handful of other sort of influencers in the tech space. Next thing I know, the my tweet about this cool tool that I built on Saturday had been seen by like 200,000 people on Twitter and everybody was sharing it around going, this is really cool. You should check this out. It's organizing all the tools. So that was never intended to be like part of my business. It was just kind of, this is my organization. So I took that that website and I put it on Product Hunt and I, I decided, all right, well, this is a, a cool tool. People are liking it. Let's see what happens if I put it on Product Hunt. Um, when I put it on Product Hunt, it got like the number three tool of the day, the day that I launched it. And Product Hunt sent another like 50,000 people to the website all in one day. I went on Reddit. There was a, a subreddit at the time called like um, I... I built this or something like that. I don't remember what the exact subreddit was, but it's like a, a subreddit for people that were sort of doing home development projects. And when you built a cool tool, you went and shared it on this. I built this subreddit. I went and shared it on there. It rose to the top of subreddit. 
And I just went, dang, this website that I built in literally five hours on a Saturday with my son is just all over the place now. So, you know, that was in December. I built that website in December. And so from December on, I was just all in on, let's keep this Future Tools website up to date and let's consistently crank out content on YouTube about AI. And when that chat GPT video went viral, I decided, you know what, I'm just going to start making a video every day because there's so many tools. This spreadsheet was so big. I had so many different ideas for content. I'm just going to see how long I can consistently put out a video every single day. So on YouTube, I started putting out a video every day and I went, I think about 30 days before I started to feel the burnout and started to run out of ideas for what to make videos about. But in that 30 day period on YouTube, I went from having 1,500 subscribers on my YouTube channel to having over 200,000 subscribers on a YouTube channel in just a 30-day window, which was like unheard of. And yeah, that's pretty much the story well, up and, until now. And, and I think you're, uh, how many subscribers do you have on YouTube right now? I'm just approaching 400,000. And you get about 2 million views a month on your videos, if I'm not mistaken, based on the public data that I've seen. Does that sound about right? Yeah, in the in the early days when I was doing thirty video, when I did thirty videos in a single month, that month I did about six million views. Um, but now it averages about two million views a month. And then your website, your tool site, is getting ridiculous amount of traffic as well, right? Like hundreds of thousands or even millions of views. It's per getting month. a million views a month. Yeah, about two hundred fifty thousand yeah. views a week. Yeah. So you must be feeling really good, man. <laughs> done, this is what I love about this story: is you've gone from. You know, for many years, creating content specifically WordPress focused and entrepreneurial mm -hmm. focused. And then you just decided to do something uh, that was kind of hot and you did a little something contrarian in the beginning. And then you just kept doubling down and you kept doubling down. And now you've got this incredible opportunity in front of you. Obviously, I'm bringing you on the show here because <laughs> of what you're doing. Right. And yeah. and I think it's just so awesome. It just shows you the power of uh, content. Now, um, before we get into the tools and stuff, mm -hmm. I want to, there's people listening right now that might be a little skeptical about AI, especially mm -hmm. marketers who are like, feel threatened by it. Um, what do you want to say as to why they should pay attention to what we're going to talk about and why they should pay attention in general to AI? Well, I mean, when it comes to AI, first of all, it's, it's, it's sort of like the, the genie is out of the bottle, right? You're not putting it back in. AI is here. Um, you know, I, I know that's not sort of a, the best defense against AI, but I also have this philosophy of, well, it's here, it's not going anywhere. They're not going to be able to put that genie back in the bottle. So we might as well start to, to learn it and figure out how to use it. But also I don't see AI as a replacement for anybody. I know there's a lot of fears out there and I do, I do believe AI will replace some jobs, right? But it's mostly the jobs that nobody wants to do anyway. <laughs> the way I see AI is, is a sort of augmenting ourselves. I see AI as a way to uh, give ourselves superpowers that we couldn't already do. If you're a writer, this is going to help you write better, faster, possibly more creatively, possibly, you know, on topics that you haven't explored writing. If you're a video creator, this is going to help you up level the video production that you can do. You're going to be able to do things you never thought you'd be able to do because AI exists. You know, if you're a podcaster, it's going to make your life easier in the phases of editing, in the phases of creating show notes. So I really see AI as a way to sort of augment ourselves and to sort of give ourselves superpowers and just do whatever we're doing in a way that's better and makes our lives easier. So yes, there are a lot of fears out there. And me personally, like I still have a lot of the fears myself, like a lot of the, the fears around scams and fake news and all of the potential stuff that can come out of uh, not being able to tell the difference between what was AI generated and reality. A lot of that stuff still scares me. And I like to talk about that kind of stuff on my YouTube channel. But from a creator perspective, I see this as like the ultimate way to augment what we're doing and make our lives easier, not as a replacement for creators. I think there's always going to be that need for human creativity. I, I think with you know YouTube in, in general, there's a lot of AI channels out there that don't show their face and they might use text-to-speech voices on their videos. And one of the reasons people gravitate towards my YouTube videos is because I am a real person. I am a face. You can bump into me at a conference and, you know, get a selfie with me and like 
I'm a, I'm a real person. And a lot of the YouTube channels about AI that sort of hide a little bit don't seem to get as much traction. So I think humans still want that human to human connection. And I don't think that's going to go away no matter how big AI gets. I agree with you. And I do think that marketers that embrace what we're about to talk about next are going to have a competitive edge. Just like marketers who got involved early in social media had a competitive edge over those that were resistant. Because, mm. you know, I've been around for a long time, way before I had all this gray hair. And I remember everybody saying social media is a scam. It's for those stupid cat videos or <laughs> people talking about the dumbest things, right? And now it's become an integral part of marketing as we know it today. Same thing is happening with AI. Yeah, so absolutely. the way we're going to learn today is we're going to talk specifically about some of the cool stuff that you're doing to create your content so that the people that are listening can get inspired by it. We're going to start with your YouTube thumbnails. Um, mm -hmm. For those that haven't seen Matt's YouTube channel, which is, again, youtube.com slash Matt Wolf with an E on the end of it, um, he creates these really beautiful YouTube thumbnails, and you eat your own dog food metaphorically. You use... <laughs> the AI tools to actually do the cool stuff. And I'm here to tell you what they look like is they have this uh, these awesome backgrounds and these pictures of Matt doing various different things. <laughs> but Matt has told me in preparation for this show that all of this is done by AI. Is that correct, Matt? Yep, totally done by AI. I, I mean, I sort of do the final assembly myself in Canva, but all of the images are generated with AI, all of the, you know, the vibrant backgrounds, it's, it's all AI. And so to, to sort of break it down, I use a handful of tools. I, I'm not like a, a, a purist or a maximalist on any sort of one AI tool. I like Midjourney. I like Stable Diffusion. I like Dolly. These are all image generator tools. And, you know, there's a lot of people on Twitter that there's a, almost like a battle. Like, oh, I'm, I'm a Midjourney guy or I'm a Adobe Firefly guy or I'm a Dolly guy or whatever, right? But I use them all. I, I, I use this tool and I pull it into this tool to make it a little bit better. And then I bring it into this tool. And and so I'm, I'm constantly mixing and matching these tools to get the best possible results. So to break down the way the thumbnails are made, I actually used a tool called Dream Booth to train my own face into Stable Diffusion, into one of these AI models. And the way I did it, I did it, you know, almost a year ago now. I don't know if I'd recommend doing it the same way I did it because there's actually tools that have popped up that have made it a little bit easier. But I did it in what's called a Google Collab, which is uh, sort of pre-written code where you can go in and change some of the, you know, some of the variables in the code and then it'll run the code for you and then it'll spit out the, the final trained model for you. But there's a tool out there called dreamlook.ai, which basically runs dream booth for you without all of the sort of technical hassle. So if you go to dreamlook.ai, that's the tool that I would use to sort of train your face into the model now. And the way it works is you're going to upload 20 to 25 images of yourself, um, you know, maybe five of them from the waist up and then another 15 from just headshots but you want to have different angles on your head. You want to be, you know, getting your profile, looking straight into the camera, looking up, wearing different shirts, different clothing in each image. Because if you're, if, if you just take 25 pictures and just throw them all on there and you're wearing the exact same shirt, the model is going to think that the shirt is part of what you want trained into the model. So all of your images will show you wearing that same shirt. But so you want to wear different clothes and different poses. What about for women um, who have long hair and different hairstyles? Do you recommend that they keep one? hairstyle what's your thoughts on that uh you can definitely train multiple hairstyles because when you start generating images in there you can uh you can change the hairstyle on the image or you know say draw me with long blonde hair if you're a brunette or, right. or, or, or things like that really what you want is you want to make sure that, like the facial structure is really what's being seen and trained into the image because that's what's going to be the most obvious you can redraw yourself with different hair colors different hair lengths just make sure that the profile and your your sort of facial and eye structure and you know jawline and all that kind of stuff or what's what's really in focus so i've i've definitely seen people train it with different hairstyles even different hair colors um that it's not it's not as big of a deal you just want to make sure that it gets that the facial features so once you get in. the images into this tool dreamlook.ai like tell us what 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 can it output i mean like help us understand that because that sounds kind of exciting 
Yeah, so once you've got these images trained in there, you can literally have it output whatever you want. So you're going to give it like a code word. Like for me, my my social media handles are Mr. Eflow. It's, you know, Eflow is just wolf backwards if anybody's curious. But um, so my social media handles are Mr. Eflow. So I use that as like my code word, right? So if I go and generate an image, I might say an image of Mr. Eflow with long blonde hair, surfing at the beach with a shark coming out of the waves, right? Literally anything you can imagine. But because I put that little Mr. E-Flow code word in there, it's going to draw it in my likeness. That's the sort of code word that I trained in that whenever it sees that code word, it's going to draw a picture of me. You don't want to use a code word like, you know, I I, I wouldn't want to use Matt or you wouldn't want to use like, you know, Stacy or Tina or like just a, you, you know, a, a pretty common name because then it doesn't know it's specifically you. You want to kind of create a, a word that, is going to be unique to you. And then once you train it on that code word, you can put that into any prompt you can imagine, and it will try to generate that image. Of- are you using mid journey at this point or are you using stable diffusion? Like it sounds like the stream patches into some other tool, right? Yeah. So this is going to be using stable diffusion. This isn't mid journey yet. So okay. stable diffusion is going to be more where you can train your face into it. Mid journey doesn't really have that ability to train any additional information into the models yet. So it, it will be stable diffusion. Um, so what this, what Dream Look is going to do, or Dream Booth is going to do, is it's going to create the model for you that you are then going to need to run inside of like an AI image generator program. And what I recommend for that is actually a tool called Run Diffusion. It's a, a cloud version of Stable Diffusion. So it's I, I, you know it costs like fifty cents an hour, and in one hour you could probably generate. 50 images in it. So, you know, for 50 cents, you could probably generate 50 images inside of Run Diffusion. So, what you'll do is you'll train the model in DreamLook. DreamLook will give you a little uh, file that, that you can then take that file, put it into Run Diffusion, which will be the sort of, you know, stable diffusion tool that you can generate your images within. So, you don't, you wouldn't actually generate the images inside of DreamLook. You're just going to train the model with DreamLook, if that makes got sense. It, got it, got it, got it. Okay, cool. So, we've got this. Now, we've got through this process you've just talked about, which mm-hmm. we're going to document inside of the show notes if anybody can't track all this stuff. Um, we've got this uh, ability to generate a version of Matt Wolf from Michael Stelzner or mm-hmm. whoever else, right? And you can type it in there and have it generate whatever you want. There's more to it, obviously. So once you've got that, what do you normally do with that with your thumbnails? So what I like to do is I think mid journey is probably the best at making these like really beautiful color contrast image, right? I think mid journey is just so good with their color palettes. Every image that comes out of mid journey just looks good. You can, you can literally put just cat as your prompt and you'll get an image that just looks amazing from mid journey. Stable diffusion on the other hand, you got to get a little bit more creative with prompting. You know, you've probably heard the term thrown around prompt engineering. Stable diffusion requires a little more prompt engineering where you might try 15 different prompts before you finally get something that you're happy with. Mid journey, it, it, you know, it, it's brain dead simple. You can just toss in any sort of keyword and it will generate an image for you. So what I like to do is actually generate an image of myself with the stable diffusion tools you know, I, I like to make sort of silly images that look like other viral YouTube videos, like, you know, like a Mr. Beast video where he might have like a like a big shocked look on his face. I like to make images of, you know, Mr. E flow with a shock look on his face with his hands in the air. And I try to recreate some of those viral looking thumbnail images with just my face. And then I'll use mid journey to get the sort of vibrant color backgrounds that really pop off the screen when you're browsing YouTube. So if you look at a lot of my YouTube thumbnails, they have really colorful, vibrant backgrounds. Those are usually generated with mid-journey. And a lot of times my prompt will literally be something like a colorful fantasy world. And it, that'll just be the whole prompt. And then I will take that color, colorful fantasy world. I'll pull that into Canva, set that as the background in Canva, pull in the image that I made in Stable Diffusion of my you know shocked look on my face, And then Canva has a background remover. So if they generate any background on it, it'll remove the background and just have my, you know, my face shot on it with the colorful background. And then I go in and I add my text in Canva. And that's pretty much my process for creating thumbnails is mid journeys, the background, the stable diffusion with my face trained into it is the the foreground image of me shocked or whatever. And then I put my text on the thumbnail using Canva and usually for every video, I'll make two or three variations and, 
sort of look at them all side by side and figure out which one I'm most happy with and then end up using that. And then when I upload it onto YouTube, I'll wait 24 hours. If it's not getting as high of a click-through rate as my past videos do, I'll swap it out with one of the other ones that I made. And I would imagine for people that use Photoshop, you could accomplish the exact same thing in Photoshop, right? You can't you can't really train your own face into Photoshop. Oh, using I meant knocking out the backgrounds. Uh, oh, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. In lieu, yeah, so Canva, you can... in lieu of Canva, you could use Photoshop, right? We were absolutely. talking about Photoshop generative fill. Did you want to bring that up at all? Yeah. So Photoshop generative fill actually uses a whole other model other than stable diffusion, other than mid journey. It actually uses what's called Adobe Firefly which is another generative AI art model. But what that can do is you can pull an image inside of Photoshop and then just select a little area on Photoshop, tell it generative fill. If you leave it blank, it tries to guess what should be in that spot. Or you can give it a prompt and say, I want an airplane in that spot. And in the little area that you highlighted with your selector tool, it'll put a little airplane flying right within that area. So sometimes just to add a little bit extra, if you want to... Take the image that you generated with Mid Journey, use that as your background. Take the headshot image that you generated with Stable Diffusion, pull those all into Adobe Photoshop. You can use the generative fill tool to add little extra elements or to fix some things. You know, sometimes Stable Diffusion will generate a hand with seven fingers on it instead of five fingers. Well, if you pull it into Adobe Photoshop, you can usually highlight just that hand, click generative fill, and it will actually try to replace that hand with one that looks good. Now, sometimes generative fill will just generate another one with nine fingers instead of seven figures, but you can keep on clicking that generative fill button until the hand looks right. So it's a, okay. it's a nice tool for sort of little cleanup and, and polishing. Crazy question. Um, mm -hmm. Let's say you don't like the t-shirt that was generated or whatever. Can you use Adobe generative fill to like change the style of your clothing or something like that? You can absolutely do that. Yeah. So you can use, you know, like the magic wand selector tool in Photoshop and select the entire shirt or use the outlining tool in Photoshop and, and select the tool. And you can literally type pink shirt. And if you're wearing a white shirt, it'll turn it to a pink shirt. Uh, you could, I've, I've done stuff where I've just taken a shirt that looks plain and had it turn it into like a tie dye shirt. So yeah, you can definitely change even the clothing you're wearing. You can even, so let's say you're wearing uh, a, a dress in the image that it generated. You can select the whole thing and say, put me in a t-shirt and pants, and it will actually change the, the clothes that you're wearing to a t-shirt and pants instead of the dress that you're wearing. How so, good is the quality? Is it very good? Uh, hit or miss, right? The, the the beautiful thing about generative fill is you can click that button as many times as you want. So if you don't like what it generates the first time, you keep clicking it until you find something that you like. Very cool. Mm -hmm. So everything we've been talking about is just for YouTube thumbnails, mm -hmm. but there's nothing stopping this from being a ad that you could put in the Google AdWords, right? Or a Facebook image that you could use in Google, right? I mean, like this whole thing we just yeah. talked about could be applied to almost anything that requires an image. Am I right? Oh, absolutely. I've, I've seen people that have, you know, sort of, uh, you know, face creams or, or, or lotions or things like that. And they'll actually generate uh, an image in mid journey of like a beach scene with, um, you know, maybe like a hammock and a table sitting next to the hammock. And then they'll pull that image that they generated into Photoshop. And then they'll, you know, apply the image of their, you know, their hand cream or their face cream sitting on the table next to the hammock. And now you've got a, a, a beautiful shot of a beach, but with your, your product shot sitting next to you on the beach. So I've definitely seen it used quite a bit in advertising and, and for business purposes as well. It's it's another great use case for it. How long does it take you now that you've been doing this pretty consistently from idea to execution uh, on these thumbnails? You know, it, it's funny because a lot of times the YouTube thumbnails, I'll spend almost as much time creating them as I will actually recording the video itself. Um, but I can create a thumbnail in probably 10 minutes total now. But the reason I take longer is more just my own sort of uh, neurosis, right? Like I'll, I'll create an image and I'll be like, I, I don't like that. I want this to be over on this side. And then I'll sort of regenerate it. So for me, it's more like I'll, I'll probably spend 30 to 40 minutes generating a thumbnail. But it's more because I'm just trying to be very perfectionist with it. I'll, I'll, I'll see something I don't like and I'll almost start from scratch and, and do it again. But you, you can do it in about 10 minutes once you get fast at it. It's the, the initial training of your face is the longest part. Once you've done that, everything else is pretty quick. What's great about this is for those people that are not graphic designers and don't have the money to go out and hire a professional graphic designer, this 
allows anyone to create stunning visuals right because mm. i would imagine you don't have a background as an artist do you no <laughs> no no i was uh, a pretty bad graphic designer before ai came well, along and i also started thinking about split testing you know youtube is starting is going to be rolling out native mm. uh, split testing for thumbnails and with uh, i think two buddy you can do it but right. you know having images for split testing is also something a lot of marketers care about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you could throw a couple AI generated ones in there up against your graphic design team. Right. And you can, you can kind of see which ones perform better. Really, really cool stuff. All right. Yeah. Um, now let's talk about the written word. Uh, mm -hmm. You have your email newsletter mm -hmm. and you're using a lot of AI tools to help you with that. So why don't you talk to us a little bit about how you're using AI for your email newsletters? Yeah. So, you know, a big piece of my newsletter is I like to say it's the sort of TLDR of the week in AI. So the newsletter is a handful of the cool tools that I came across, a handful of news pieces that I came across throughout the week. So a big piece of it is staying in the loop with all of the latest tools that are coming out, all of the latest news that are coming out. And the way I stay so in the loop is I actually use an old school RSS reader called Feedly. Um, it's been around forever, but they recently added AI into it. They actually have AI called uh, Feedly Leo. And what Feedly Leo does is it goes and sort of scours the web for any keywords that you're, you're, you you want to find articles on, similar to like a Google alert, right? It'll, it'll kind of keep track of any time the word artificial intelligence is mentioned inside of any sort of news source, and it will pull that in like it's an RSS reader. However, what Feedly Leo does is you actually train it on the type of content you want to see. So I have a RSS feed reader that every day it feeds me maybe 100 articles that come up on uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, generative art, you know, all of the various topics that I like to, to stay looped in on. But a lot of times it might be like somebody's medium article that's an opinion piece around why chat GPT is better than some other platform. And I don't really want that. I want to stay in the loop with the news. I don't really want to hear too many people's opinions. So I can actually sort of downvote it. It will stop showing me articles that are similar to that. So over time, you start to train this news feed to only show you the articles that you want to see. So now I have a finely tuned RSS feed of just the artificial intelligence news and tools that I want to see every day. And it automatically filters out all of the stuff that I'm not interested in. So Every day I pop into this Feedly tool, do a quick skim and just read all of the news articles in one sitting. It probably takes me 20 minutes a day and I just kind of read all of the headlines. When something grabs my attention, I open it in a new tab, keep reading the headlines, open something in a new tab. Next thing I know, I've got, you know, seven tabs open of this is all the important news for the day. And that's how I'm keeping in the loop with all of the AI news every single day. And when something really grabs my interest, I put it on future tools. You know, it's it's not just an aggregator for tools anymore. I also aggregate news on it as well. So I throw it onto the, the Future Tools website so that when it comes around time to write my newsletters on Friday, I've got a list of here's all the news that I found interesting for this week. Here's all the tools that I found interesting for this week. So that's sort of piece one is using Feedly Leo. Now, I'm also subscribed to a handful of RSS feeds just, to, you know, the standard way, right? I subscribe to OpenAI's blog, I subscribe to Google's blog, Microsoft, Apple, Meta, all of the big companies that are, you know, sort of building stuff in AI right now. I just subscribe directly to the RSS feeder. But then Feedly Leo goes and finds all the other stuff that would have never popped onto my radar otherwise. By and the way, I, I love this because for anybody who is in the business of curating content, it can be a very um challenging proposition and you can also miss really important stuff if you're only doing what you used to do which is probably just following the major rss feeds and blogs right Absolutely. because then you miss all sorts of stuff and it sounds like this leo feedly leo thing has allowed you to discover some really cool stuff you might not have ever discovered is that a fair assessment oh yeah i mean it, it, it'll find stuff on food blogs or mommy bloggers or, or stuff like that where you know sometimes these smaller news sources are breaking news before a lot of the bigger platforms ever find out about them so you know you know when gpt4 got released what most of us in the ai space found out about it from a random german blog that we all then translated to english to find out that gpt4 was coming out next week and wow. the article wasn't actually released in the us it was released in german on a german blog because somebody at microsoft germany accidentally leaked it at one of their press conferences and so 
we found it from this. I don't even remember the name of the site, but it, it's, you know, stuff like that happens where we'll find out information that we wouldn't get by just keeping an eye on the Microsoft blog. So it's been super effective for, for just finding little things like that. You know, I, I, I don't follow a lot of SEO blogs, but a lot of SEO blogs pop up on my radar because they're reporting, um, you know, Google is starting to slap down this type of content that was written by this AI tool and stuff like that starts to pop up on SEO blogs that you would never find on one of the bigger, you know, corporate blogs. Love it. Okay. So first of all, you're using AI to discover content mm -hmm. to put in your newsletter. Uh, keep going with the process of how you're using AI to help you with the newsletter. Yeah. So then what I do is, well, before I was using chat GPT and I was taking a lot of this information, a lot of these articles, a lot of the news, and I was having chat GPT summarize them for me. So I would take these articles and I would copy and paste the entire article into chat GPT. And I would say, um, summarize this down into a short paragraph because in my newsletter, you know, I link over to the article so you can go read it, but I also want to give you that TLDR. I want to give you that quick hit of, if you're not going to go read this newsletter, here's what it says for you. Well, that little, here's what it says for you is mostly generated with chat GPT. I just paste the whole article in and say, summarize this into a paragraph. Now I say I used to use chat GPT because now um, Anthropic released a tool called Claude 2, which in my opinion actually works better at summarizing long articles down to short articles. But same thing. You can use ChatGPT or Claude or any of the AI language so, models. Know, let's, about that. let's talk about that a little bit. The good news about ChatGPT is at least, I think it's if you have the paid version in beta, you can put links in there. So now you could actually say, go summarize this with the link and it will go out and do it, right? In ChatGPT. Which it did for a little while. They actually disabled that function recently, and it's been disabled uh, for a good uh, three weeks or month or so now. You know, so by the time this episode comes out, it might be available again, though. <laughs> yeah, talk to us about Claude too, because um, I'm going to say most of my audience doesn't know what that is, uh, and I've heard rumblings about how it's actually potentially even better than ChatGPT. So, why don't you talk to us a little bit about that? So Claude 2, you know, if you're familiar with ChatGPT, it does a lot of the same types of stuff. It's a large language model that's trained on all sorts of data, and you can ask it questions. You can copy and paste content into it and have it summarize the content, put it into bullet points. It'll write creative stories. It'll do poems. It'll write code. Most of the stuff you've heard ChatGPT can do, Claude can also do. The big difference between Claude and ChatGPT is what's called the context window. So ChatGPT has a 16,000 token context window. And what that means is that between the input and output text, you get about roughly 9,000 words. So you can, between the amount of words that you input in your prompt and the words that it will output combined, you'll get about 9,000 words. It's roughly 75% of what that token window is. So with Chat GPT, assume 8,000, 9,000 words is what you're going to get between input and output of text. With Claude, their context window is 100,000 tokens, meaning that you're going to get about 75,000 words between input and output, which opens up so many more possibilities because now you can, you know, a, a, a typical book that you would pick up at the library is less than 75,000 words. So theoretically, you can take an entire PDF of an entire book plug it into Claude and say, summarize this book into bullet points for me, and Claude will be able to do it. It's got a large enough context window to get the combined input and output text that you're looking for. So I've found Claude really, really helpful because I can take really long articles, 5,000, 6,000 word articles, plug them into Claude, and it's going to do a lot better job at summarizing them and pulling out the bullet points for me than ChatGPT will, will just because of that larger context window that Claude has available. So hopefully I explained that in a way that's yeah, not too totally, confusing. <laughs> totally. Does Claude um, work with external links yet? And is it, what's its cost? I'm just curious. So Claude right now is totally free to use. I believe it's in, you know, an open beta where anybody can use it. Um, you can just find it at Claude.ai. And as of now, it's it's free. Anybody can just jump in and use it right now, just kind of like ChatGPT was when they first opened it. Whether there's going to be a cost in the future, I'm not sure yet. They haven't made any announcements about that. But yeah, it's it's totally free to use. Now, as far as links go, you can't just copy a URL and say, tell me what's on this URL. But you can go and copy all of the content of that website, paste it into Anthropic, 
and have it summarize that for you. But it doesn't go and search the web for you yet, like Chat GPT did a month ago, but doesn't currently do. But it 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 can't do that yet. And the the reason a lot of these large language models aren't letting you search the web right now is because the the large language models don't know how to respect paywalls yet. So they were finding people can plug in a you know a New York Times article that New York Times would want you to pay to read the article. And chat GPT would just go and read that article for you and tell you everything that's in it without you having to pay for it. So mm. that's the reason they've been disabling it in all these various tools is they're trying to figure out how to respect these businesses paywalls. Well, I love, I, before we pivot to our next question here, I, I just want to say, I love how you're using AI tools to help you find great stuff and then help you summarize great stuff inside of your uh, actual newsletters. I wanna talk about longer form content a little bit here. Um, and I think Claude, you know, as I'm thinking about like, for example, this podcast, we'll be producing a transcript of this podcast. Mm -hmm. And one of the struggles that we run into is creating articles out of these podcasts. We have to obviously pay writers and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Could something like Claude take the transcripts out of uh, a podcast interview like this and help us radically simplify the article creation? 100%. Yeah. I mean, it, it'll actually be great at that. Now, you can also use ChatGPT for that. Um, ChatGPT for, for oh, writing an article. It's, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of words. That's the only problem, right? Like we've tried it with ChatGPT and we have to do it in chunks normally. Yeah. So the way to make it work with ChatGPT is you would turn on the uh, the code interpreter. So they have a new plugin inside oh, of ChatGPT oh, no. called Code Interpreter. If you turn that on, it actually lets you upload files and it will read files instead of what you paste in. So if you were to take your entire transcript, paste it into a text file, upload the text file, and then say, summarize what's in this text file for me, then it will sort of get around that additional context limit with Code Interpreter turned on. And wow. ChatGPT is actually a little bit better, in my opinion, still at writing longer form articles, where Claude is a bit better, in my opinion, at summarizing stuff, right? So if you want a summary of like a paragraph or two, Claude is your answer. If you want a creative article that kind of sounds like your voice, I would probably still go to ChatGPT I would just do it in that way where I would put the transcript inside of a text file, turn on code interpreter, upload the text file, and then say, you know, summarize this or write an article or give me bullet points from this text article. Now, I know we were also talking about uh, ChatGPT video summarizer, or I don't know if that's a tool or if it's just something it can do. Can ChatGPT mm -hmm. somehow work with a video and summarize it without you having to watch an hour long video? Yeah, so that's another thing that's in the you know the plus the pro version of Chat GPT. They have plugins now where you can actually turn on various plugins that just like WordPress adds additional functionality to Chat GPT. They actually have one called YouTube Video Summarizer. So if you turn on plugins, you can go into the their little plugin store, find the YouTube Video Summarizer. When you turn that on, it'll allow you to plug in a YouTube video and basically allow you to ask questions of that video. So it'll It'll say, all right, here's a quick summary of the video, and then you can have a conversation with that video. All right, so what is the tool that Matt's recommending in this video? Oh, he's recommending um, you know, Playground by OpenAI. What's the benefit of Playground OpenAI over ChatGPT? Well, according to Matt, this, 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 and this are the pros of it over ChatGPT. And so you can start to have conversations with the content of that video. We also talked about something that I don't think you have as much experience in, but you're familiar with it a little bit, uh, is the Adobe Premiere plugin. Do you do you understand what that does and how that works? Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I couldn't explain how it works, but I definitely know what it does. So there's an Adobe Premiere plugin that will actually, if you have a multi-track video recording, so let's say you've got uh, an interview, a one-to-one -one interview, you've got a shot of one guest, you've got a shot of the host, and then you've got a wide shot of both people in the picture. You can go in there and say, okay, I want it to go wide about 15% of the conversation, otherwise focus on whoever's speaking. And this plugin that works with Adobe Premiere, I'll actually have to look up the name of it and, and send that over to you. But okay. this plugin that works in Adobe Premiere will automatically detect using AI who is speaking and switch the camera to who's speaking. And then that 15% of the time will jump back to that wide shot to show both speakers. And then when you go inside of your Adobe Premiere timeline, you'll see it all chopped up in the exact way that you want it. So if you want to go in and change things and maybe I'm speaking, but 
we want to catch your reaction to it. You can go in and still fix it. So you're hearing my voice. That's really cool. You. So, so you could just set up a bunch of different cameras and then you mm -hmm. could just use this plugin, which we're going to have in the show notes and it'll automatically flip the cameras for you based on who's speaking. Have you seen anybody on YouTube that's currently using this? Yeah. Uh, so Colin and Samir, they're the ones that I actually heard about it from, but they're also, they've also demoed it on their YouTube channel. So that's, that's where I heard about it, but that's also where I've seen a demo of it. So if you check out Colin and Samir's YouTube channel, any of their interviews that they do with one of their guests, where you see them at a table, it jumps to Colin and Samir, it jumps to their guest, it jumps to the wide shot. They're using that tool to automatically jump between the cuts. Matt. There's a lot of people that are like, don't stop. This is too good. <laughs> this is too good. Um, okay. If people want to reach out to you on the socials, do you have a preferred uh, place to send them? And then we know your YouTube channel is youtube.com slash Matt, W-O-L-F-E. Yeah. Um, and uh, your website is uh, well, futuretools.io, right? Where you have your yep. blog and all that stuff. Is there um, a preferred uh, social channel that you're active on at all? Um, I'm most active on Twitter or X, I guess it's called now. Um, so I'm at Mr. Eflo <laughs> over there, M-R-E-F-L-O-W. It's just, you know, my, my name is Matt R. Wolf. So it's just Mr. is my first two initials and then Eflo is Wolf backwards. But that's my, uh, that's my Twitter handle. And I'm, I'm on that social media platform the most. I'm on social media less and less these days, kind of putting my focus on, on YouTube and the newsletter. But uh, Twitter X is where I'm at the most these days. Matt Wolf, thank you so much for coming on and opening up the Komodo mono <laughs> metaphorically and sharing how you do what you do. There's so many creators that are going to get inspired by this. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. This is this has been fun. I I mean, I could nerd out about this all day. You can tell by how I pick up the pace when I speak and I get all excited. So <laughs> love talking about this stuff.